individuals who cannot communicate. I've met some extremely articulate artists who don't speak much. I bumped into a guy at the VA hospital who couldn't speak, but handed me a poem and said, here, take. There are so many different ways to communicate. Talking isn't the only way. So through this case study, we're going to research and find how are veterans speaking to one another. From what I understand, text message is the biggest amongst us. But most of all, how are we developing those veterans? So Dr. Jim Goodwin writes, The Catalyst of Post-Traumatic Stress Disorders for Vietnam Combat Veterans. More than 8.5 million individuals served in the U.S. Armed Forces during the Vietnam era, 1964 to 1973. Approximately 2.8 million served in Southeast Asia. Of the latter number, almost 1 million saw active combat or were exposed to hostile, life-threatening situations, according to the President's Commission on Mental Health 1978, written by Jimmy Carter. In this writer's opinion, the vast majority of Vietnam era veterans have had much more problematic readjustment to civilian life than did their World War II and Korean War counterparts. This was due to the issues already discussed in this chapter, as well as to the state and to the economy and the inadequacy of the GI Bill in the early 1970s. In addition, the combat veterans of Vietnam, many of whom immediately tried to become assimilated back into the peacetime culture, discovered that their outlook and feelings about their relationships and future life experiences had changed immensely. According to the fantasy, all was to be well again when they returned home from Vietnam. The reality for many was quite different. So this week on Outpost 422, we're going to dissect that. We're going to do a critical analysis of what exactly this doctor is talking about, Catalyst. But it's not going to be according to these Vietnam veterans. This is coming straight from an individual who served during the Somali era, who was left untreated for 20 years, who also has developed a unique perspective through the program here at Madison College called Argumentation and Debate. During that period of time I learned how to write an op-ed which is taking the unique perspective and arguing it. But also what really helped develop a catalyst for me was understanding the rhetoric that people were using against me to speak divergently which means to push me off to the side and to catch these sentences when they were coming at me and realize that they're just claims. And when I was able to read and hear about those claims, I was able to also adjust the way I thought, which helped me adjust what they were saying as simply just a really nasty word that somebody wanted to say to me at the time. Now, analysis has given me awareness, has opened the door to showing me myself. Some people are in the earliest stages of post-traumatic stress disorder. Some have gotten so progressively worse that they don't even know who they are. According to the VA, I'm somewhere in the middle. So instead of coming on here and being all happy-go-lucky and doing a cheerleader show and playing you a bunch of pop rock, I'd rather tell you what it looks like when you climb down from that guard tower for the last time and you leave the overwatch and the quick reactionary force behind you and you spend day after day in a trance, wondering what was it that you just did. Because it's, it's the, the most complete inhumane form of existence here on earth. The third world. It's like going to the zoo with humans. That's the best way I describe going to a third world nation. Because you see the human condition and it's worst. It's worst. So this catalyst of post-traumatic stress disorder. 
What exactly is the catalyst? Well, according to the Merriam-Webster definition, a catalyst is a substance that enables a chemical reaction to proceed at a usually faster rate or under different conditions than otherwise possible. Okay. Didn't quite match up with what we were talking about. So there was a second one, and this is the one that stands out the most. A catalyst is an agent that pro provokes or speaks change or action. A catalyst is an agent that provokes or speeds change or action. That makes sense. So if I tell you not to cross the street when there's a bus coming, you're probably not going to get hit. So isn't that what Overwatch is all about? So Outpost 422 in Overwatch is about creating catalysts in the community. So now we go into the rhetorical analysis of it all. So the claim was made by the doctor. More than 8 million individuals served in the U.S. Armed Forces during the Vietnam era, from 1964 to 1973. I actually did find that to be factual. I went out to uh, U.S. War Dogs Association to fact check. That, that number is extremely accurate because there was 2,709,918 Americans who served in Vietnam and that this number represents 9.7% of their generation. 9.7% of their generation. So 10% of the people in America fought in Vietnam in the 60s and 70s. So this doctor is serving those who were serving in this capacity in an attempt to investigate where they found catalyst. So then the second part of the discussion, obviously, is the part of the claim about where they served. Of the latter number, almost 2.8 million served in Southeast Asia. At least 1 million saw active combat or were exposed to hostile life-threatening situations. So almost 2.8 million served and almost one million saw active combat. What were they exposed to? The hostile side of life, the hostile side of human nature. They were stuck in life-threatening situations and 35% of those who served in Vietnam were exposed. Now if one million out of 2.8 million were exposed to this, those one million people have what is called a trauma-informed mind. So what does a hostile fire situation require for Overwatch details? Well, it's extraction, perimeter Overwatch, quick reactionary force. Those are all aspects of it. So when I come back from combat, and continuously, I served three tours in JRTC, which is Joint Readiness Training Center. We would do Bach War. So that kept reigniting. It, it reignites it all over again. And in the middle of this process, as you're relighting the flame every time that you're going back to this conflict, you become a conflicting individual. Your human nature, after going through this process of development, is to be a conflicting individual. Being stuck in conflict leads to speaking conflict. Well, that's the nature of flux. Well, who better than this program to investigate and discover through hypothesis the nature of divergent flux. When you speak to me and in a subtle way you tell me to get lost or you say to me you're a non-traditional student, get lost, can't you take a hint? On several occasions I've had professors say, you know we have these classes online, right? Well, in a divergent way, you're telling me to stop coming to the classroom and spend more time online in a recluse nature. Do you realize the claim that you're making there? The whole sole purpose of this case study with Vital is so that we get out in the society and we start integrating with other people. 
it's, it's never did I, I ever imagine in a million years that I would be in this setting at 40, four years of life. But I want to maximize that. I want to give back to the community and be a catalyst. I think being an honor student is being a catalyst. And so far, so good. When I first started out in school, it was really rocky. I tried five classes in one semester and met the Madison College Challenge. Wrote a 25-page business plan on top of those five classes. But I learned a lot about myself. When I kept going to those meetings and myself and my counselor were doing prototypes on the whiteboard in the office, he kept asking me, why do you want to bleed yourself out to human beings so much? The answer is simple. I spent three months of my life in an orphanage protecting young children from being attacked by militants. It's in my human nature. It's in my divergent nature. It's in my conflict nature to nurture and to care and to be a watchdog. Being a watchdog is what led me into journalism. And I'm hell-bent to get a three-week study abroad in Afghanistan to go meet those who are like me and to reach out to them the same way that Bob Hope did to, to get down to brass tacks and get help. Find that help and service in the community. So now, moving along with the analysis, part C, the next segment, it is the writer's opinion that the vast majority of Vietnam era veterans have had a much more problematic readjustment to civilian life than did their World War II and Korean War counterparts. Bingo. Bingo. So what I've been researching and studying about crowdsourcing with these Vietnam veterans downtown who are you know, living in shelters, who choose the outdoor life, I call it bivouac, is that they just can't seem to feel comfortable living in the confines of a conventional home. They like moving from place to place. It goes with their nature. And so what I'm on a mission to do is to find a way for us to be able to put sort of like a senior center down there for those who are having a hard time readjusting. I'm one of them. It's hard. But I'm extremely passionate about helping distribute some of that weight. That's what the crux is all about. Taking that burden off the individual who is struggling with readjustment and not judging them. Diversity. I learned in Madison College Intro to Diversity is a healthy form of helping somebody who's struggling with readjustment issues, not just veterans. We have Individuals who have gender dysphoria, who spent time overseas as POWs and have developed this condition, who are being shunned from going to the VA. Why? Because they were once a man and now they identify as a woman. They served our country at the highest capacity and honor that is going to combat and being all that they can be. The least we can do in America is open the floodgate for them to get help with mental health. Readjustment comes from the simple fact that you don't have those services available to you. I wish I could count how many times I've met somebody on State Street who just wished they would have made a better choice while they were in the military and they didn't have a dishonorable conduct, a dishonorable discharge. All they wanted was to serve the military at the highest honor and they made a mistake and now they can't get help and now they're stuck living on State Street because they don't know where to go well there is a place for you to go 
pick up the phone, please go find a phone right now if you are one of these individuals who are my friends and pick up one 877 vet 4 aid -V -E -T. reach out to Prairie Legal Services in Rockford, Illinois. They will help you find an apartment. In 2018, I started going downtown just to hang out because, you know, I stumbled across this adopt plot program, created the 422nd Rescue and Recovery Brigade, blah, blah, blah. I'll post 422 at Lower Link Peace Park, all this good stuff. And I found these individuals downtown, had nowhere to go, and had nobody looking out for them. Handed them the card. Was a ambitious service officer at the time. Handing out cards, Veterans Crisis Line cards, uh, 187748 vet cards, and we're handing those cards out. It was because I understood that there is a readjustment issue here. So when we have that many people having readjustment issues, the first thing we do is we send law enforcement after them to tase them and kick them around and throw them around with their billy clubs. Because that's what we've elected them to do. Is it not? It's not their fault. We enact these vagrancy laws so that these individuals get lost in Washington, D.C., they put spikes down on windowsills so that people who are homeless don't lay down and go to sleep. So that leads me back to this whole thing. Is homelessness patriotic? If we're putting spike strips down and we're beating them up with law enforcement, is that patriotic? How are we as citizens helping those who are in our communities that need help by beating the crap out of them? But anyway, that's what's talking about here, this doctor's opinion. The doctor's opinion holds a lot of weight. Doctors make decisions on behalf of veterans all the time. I've had several make decisions regarding my condition saying it's not service-connected, therefore putting me into financial crisis. Another part of the readjustment problem. Putting a veteran in financial crisis because there's not enough, quite enough evidence for them to be completely disabled. So we're going to send them back onto the workplace and exacerbate their condition even more. That's the logic here. That's the logic in the comp, comp and pen claim system. Send them back onto society. Let them get worse. And then treat them. Really. That's your solution. Well, in my opinion, I don't, I don't like that. So part D, in addition, the com combat veterans of Vietnam tried to assimilate back into peacetime culture. Think about that for a second. Reflect on that for a second. Peacetime culture. That means... The people that you're in society amongst. Now think about this. Long and hard. 1967. I'm doing case studies on this. I'm doing sidebar writing on this. The CIA was testing on UW-Madison grounds. And in 1967, in October, a riot broke out on campus. A protest. Does that sound like peace, peacetime culture? So this individual, and I actually have two individuals downtown who are homeless veterans that were living on State Street when the Dow Riot happened and know where Leo Burt went. It's just fascinating. Because one of those individuals is actually a student at UW-Madison. I'm telling his story. Now his story is called John Q. Battlefield. I'm protecting his identity because as a service officer, that's what I do. I don't need to divulge your information. It's against the law. 
quite frankly, when you share your VA condition with me, it's against the law. I would rather you go see your service officer at the county, Dane County Service Office. I'm just your usher. So this guy ran out of nitroglycerin, and nobody downtown would help him. Help me, help me, please. Individual was a prisoner of war in Korea, served two tours in Vietnam. Is a justice involved veteran. That's what John Q. Battlefield is. We're all those who were at one point uh, in trouble with the law. He was the sergeant in arms of the Vietnam veterans of America in the prison system. And nobody wanted to help him. But the most ironic part of it all, I asked him, what is it exactly you're doing for work right now? How can we help you? Because after this intake interview that I do with them, I, sh I send them over to Dry Hooch, who actually has social workers that take care of this. He said, I'm a student at UW-Madison under the Senior Citizens Admissions Program. So we have a senior citizen Vietnam veteran POW from Korea attending school at the University of Wisconsin who is a resident of State Street. That's America. That's patriotism. And in my opinion, that individual is more patriotic than any one of us. And nobody was there to help him. Now I'm not taking credit and patting myself on the back, it's my job as a service officer to help people. But seriously, this is what you find when you crowdsource and investigate on State Street. And this is from the capital to the University of Wisconsin, Madison. You would think one of our elected officials who was walking down that street would take time to at least reach out to somebody and say, are you okay? Can we help you? No, it's not happening. So Dr. Goodwin finds out that he discovered their outlook and feelings about their future relationships and future life experiences changed immensely. Well, with the amount of passion and conviction in my voice, I can certainly understand why. So Vietnam veterans discovered their outlook and feelings changed. Okay, that's usually a warning sign. Their future ambitions with relationships changed. And therefore, future life experiences changed immensely. So here's how the catalyst works. My ambitions when I got out of the military were to go to college and pursue general education studies. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I needed to get a degree because I didn't want to work for the rest of my life. My relationship with my ex-wife by 2003 from 97 had gotten progressively worse. Um, I pursued an apprenticeship and a trade instead of going back to school because I did not want to be a part of the academic society because this intrusive thought kept telling me that those people would never help you, that they're too snooty. And then my struggles at home quickly eroded, so I fell into the pit of layoff because of work shortage, which eventually has led to my college pursuit. I started out as a bricklayer and I am now a communications major for corporate and health. Case studies are where we're going with this because case studies are the catalyst. Case studies open the door to the last segment of our show and it talks about um, according to the fantasy all was well to begin when they return home from Vietnam. There's this fantasy we live through when we sit in the outpost. 30 days in a wake-up, 20 days in a wake-up. It's a fantasy. It's a fallacy. If we just suck it up a little bit more and we take it on a one more day, everything will be just fine. Well, that's the fantasy. All was well. Life would be different when they return home from Vietnam. And that actually sitting in that guard tower on outpost, 
the thought of returning home became a fantasy. And that's where that socio-divergent method of thinking began. I was sick and tired of serving with all the people I was with overseas. I was just so ready to catch a break. Day in and day out, day in and day out. Not having the basic needs at first, and then living through that monsoon. I mean, I've lived through a natural disaster. We suffered a monsoon in Haiti on our first tour. And I watched my battle buddy's guard tower erode right to nothing and almost kill him. And I've grown fond of him ever since. Matter of fact, we speak frequently. Pool stick, if you're out there, I love you, man. I certainly hope that you're doing well during this time of, of your life as well, because I know we're both going through this. So in conclusion, the doctor states in the ending of his paragraph, the reality for many was quite different. That's reality for us. I can't just go and sit down in a classroom without feeling different. My hardest part of my class experience is the first week when I have to ask for accommodations. And I just wish it was, was easier for us to communicate. So with this case study as we move forward, this is a call to action amongst our veteran community. Rise above. Be polite. Don't let the stuff get you down. Because people just don't know. They don't understand. It's foreign to them. Why can't we just get over it? That's the number one concept. Well, I heard one time, you know, when you transfer out of here and go to the university, you're not going to have these services. And I worried about that until the time came. And the time is now. And I've met some of the best professionals throughout that process. So no, that conflict theory is not true. The services are out there. We're supported. There's just a lot of confusion. Don't let the bureaucracy step between you and succeeding in school. There's this concept I live by, it's called principles before personalities. What were the principles they gave us in the Uniform Code of Military Justice? What was that virtue and ethic that we live by? The biggest one that I live by is treat, the, treat people the way you want to be treated, even if though in that circumstance they don't want to treat you that way. There's still, there's still a need to stay grounded. Just be cool. I hear that all the time, be cool. So thanks for tuning in this week. I look forward to meeting you all in the Madison College Challenge. This show is being entered. This clip actually is going into the documentary and storytelling project for the John Q. Battlefield. And I look forward to meeting all of you at some point outside of the classroom, getting to know one another. Let's stay close, vets. We need to step up our game and um, represent Madison College as professionals, we can do this. We're good people, we deserve college, just like everyone else. But most of all, we come from a background where we seek to protect those who are just maybe a, a little bit confused. So as we go through our vocations in and out of the classroom, I strongly urge all of us to, to be the shining light and guardians in the school and help one another by being the catalyst through our research, and reach out to those in times of crisis, and keep an eye on each other, and continue to support one another. Till next week, I'm Brad Burt, host of Outpost 422 and founder, and thank you for tuning in. God bless.